It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Changemakers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Biology is no longer destiny. Our DNA doesn't determine our health as once believed. According to the new science of epigenetics, the majority of our genes are fluid and dynamic, and their expression is shaped by what we think and what we do. Joining me today to discuss how we can influence our genes by the choices we make every day is Dr. Kenneth Pelletier, a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine. Dr. Pelletier is a clinical professor of medicine at UCSF School of Medicine and former clinical professor of medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine. He is a peer reviewer for several medical journals and has appeared on media outlets to discuss his research. Dr. Pelletier has authored numerous books, including his latest, Change Your Genes, Change Your Life. Welcome, Dr. Pelletier. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for your invitation. Looking forward to talking with you. Doctor, many people are concerned about their family history when it comes to health, and they believe that they're stuck with whatever diseases plague their loved ones. But new science shows that we have a profound influence over our health by the choices we make every day. Why is this the case? Well, uh, it's a common misconception, I think, among Uh, the general population, but even among health professionals, that the gene is like a hard drive in a computer and in various set of directions, instructions on everything from hair color to eyes to weight to diseases you will get, how long you will live, et cetera. And it's simply not accurate. Um, What we do know in the last seven or eight years with epigenetics uh, research is that probably 5 to 10% of what we see as adult health, adult longevity, uh, intelligence, uh, you know, pres- preservation of cognitive function, et cetera, uh, is due to, to genes that are monogenic or fully penetrant. In other words, they're really pushed and manifest themselves genetically. The other 90% of everything we experience from the age of about nine months through adulthood is determined by how we influence our genes, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And that's so important, doctor. Think about that. 90 to 95% we control. And I, I get excited every time I hear that because it just gives you this freedom that you don't feel like you have a sentence. You know, I come from a family, my father had lung cancer, my sister had lung cancer, my mother had heart disease. So these would be the things that most people write off and say, well, those are my genes and that's pretty much my future. But what you're explaining to us is so exciting because it doesn't have to be that way. That's correct. And you've just articulated uh, it better than I could, is no matter what you're, you, you have a push. So all of us have a push. Our genes are predisposing us to heart disease or cancer or irritable bowel syndrome or a whole, a whole host of other conditions. But that's all it is. It's a push. It does not mean it becomes manifest. And so what we're really talking about in epigenetics, epigenetics, epi means above, around the gene. And around the gene, there is literally a molecular coding, has a terribly long name, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And they're like little rheostats. We turn them up or we turn them down. And the turning it up and turning it down is dependent on diet, stress, beliefs, uh, the environment, uh, our physical environment, psychosocial environment. So what we're really talking about is that we can influence, even if we're pushed in a particular direction, we can influence that positively if we want to, or we can slow it down or even eliminate it uh, from our genetic uh, inheritance. It is not deterministic. Is that what is meant when we hear about 
flipping the switch on or off biochemical markers? Correct. And it's uh, the on-off is a little it's it's a little simple, but it's more like a rheostat. Um, where you have a light in a room and you can turn it up very bright or you can turn it down very dim if you want to have a dinner party or something. So it, our, our genes really are acting more like a rheostat rather than on and off. They're never all off. They're never silent, what they would call a silent gene, and they're never fully expressed uh, except in rare diseases, again, that show up within the first six to nine months. If you have a monogenic or what they call a fully penetrant genetic condition, it will show up within the first six to nine months of life. After that, um, it really is dependent on, again, this rheostat-like function through, through everything we do day in and day out will determine whether that shows up or is expressed or whether it is suppressed. Doctor, what do you feel is the best use of today's epigenetic research? Well, I think, the, to me, the most important thing to convey to to anyone is what we're talking about, which is you are not doomed by your genes, nor are you guaranteed a long life expectancy. So someone might say, well, my parents lived into their 90s, so I can eat and drink and do whatever I want. That's not the case. Um, You know, I, I think one of the places where we assume that genetics has the greatest influence on us is our longevity, how long we're going to live. And even that turns out to be false. There's actually a study that came out that the company Ancestry, which says does Ancestry.com, teamed up with a group of genetics researchers. And they published this study in Genetics, which is the main uh, gene research journal. What they did is they took all of the people who have reported their data into Ancestry.com, and they created a 400 million person database. Now, that's staggering. Most research is based on a few hundred or a few thousand people. This is 400 million database of parents, I'm sorry, grandparents, parents, and children. What they wanted to see is did the life expectancy or the age of death of grandparents, parents affect the children, the grandchildren, or they looked at lifestyle factors like diet, exercise, physical fitness. Did those predict better the age of the uh, grandchild? And it turned out overwhelmingly that the lifestyle factors predicted longevity, not the genetic inheritance from their parents or grandparents. So I think that's a very dramatic instance of the fact that we assume and, and, and very often that, you know, the life expectancy is governed by our genes. It is even governed there, which I think mm-hmm. is fascinating. So the best application of epigenetics is to relieve us, if you will, from the burden of feeling either that we have a guarantee, which we don't, or we have a vulnerability, which we don't. It is our choice, our selection, our involvement that makes the difference. Doctor, there's so much research that is showing the importance of lifestyle choices. Do you think that traditional medical practitioners are catching up with this information? Are they now seeing the connection between the way we live and eat with our overall health? (laughs) That's quite a challenging question. Mm -hmm. I... My, my opinion is yes, that medicine is changing, uh, and I think what we see, we see integrative medicine, personalized medicine, uh, functional medicine, and, and those three phrases are all kind of descriptions or attempts to describe this integration of lifestyle with conventional medicine. Conventional medicine is basically pharmaceuticals and surgery, diagnosis of disease. That, that's the domain of medicine. But around that is then the domain of health, which is much larger. Most of us are healthier than sick. Most of us are healthier for most of our lives than not, not well. Uh, so what we're really looking at is what is the larger picture for people day in and day out, year over year, in terms of influencing their lives. So what the new emphasis now is more on uh, bio, what are called biomarkers or basically biological indicators of your state of health. So all of us are familiar with cholesterol. I think everyone knows their total cholesterol at this point. That's a biomarker. If it's too high, it means a problem. If it's too low, it also means a problem. But if you had feedback, if you knew 
what your biomarker was and was it within an optimal range. And we can determine that for hundreds of bodily functions that are governed by genetics. Then we can optimize those. We can bring those within range through all of the various lifestyle factors we've just been talking about. When you bring them within range, you optimize your mental faculties, your physical ability, your emotional, spiritual direction in life. And that, to me, is the, is the more interesting challenge uh, for the future. And medicine is beginning to recognize that. You find Scripps Institute and the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, all of them now have lifestyle programs wrapped around the care of diseases, including cancer, heart disease, irritable bowel. So we're seeing even the major medical institutions are moving in this direction. Doctor, you say that there are at least seven biological pathways that determine which major diseases or states of health a person will potentially experience. What are they and how can we learn this information? Right. Uh, This is conventional uh, biochemistry. Uh, There are really seven biochemical pathways in the body and these are all governed by a relatively small set of genes. So this is how the genes, when I said the genes express themselves, So when the gene turns on or turns off or goes dormant, each of these pathways are in turn affected. So just quickly, just to rattle through them, and we can go back to any one of them, is methylation. And methylation is like punctuation. So it says, here's the genetic code, here's a period. That's the end of that statement. Uh, There's inflammation. We're all familiar with inflammation. We think it's a risk for heart disease, but on the positive side, it also is when we get a minor cut. That's inflammation, so we need inflammation. It's not bad. I mean, there are so many diets now that promise you to eliminate inflammation. Well, that's nice, but it's misguided. We need a certain amount of inflammation. The other third one is oxidative stress. And so we all, whenever metabolism occurs in the presence of oxygen, we get byproducts. And if it's excessive under stress, then we get excessive byproducts, and that's damaging. A fourth is detoxification, so the body is continually purging ourselves biochemically and ridding ourselves of cancer cells. All of us have cancer cells at any given point in time. Our immune system surveils it, eliminates them, etc. Then immunity is the uh, fifth, and immunity is simply how does your body know self from not self? Who are you versus the bacteria, the viruses, the other kinds of pathogens that are in our environment? And the sixth is lipid metabolism. So it's really how well do you digest fats? And we always hear about uh, the no-fat diet. We've got to eliminate fats. That's simply false. There are people that can consume very high-fat diets. They have a high, highly expressed uh, gene for lipid metabolism. They can consume fats all day long, and it doesn't harm them. So for them to go on a low-fat diet doesn't make any sense. In fact, it may even create certain hormonal deficiencies. And the last is mineral metabolism. So mineral metabolism is just that. It's all the trace elements, the zinc, the copper, all of the various kinds of uh, subfractions within foods that, on which we depend for our health. So those are the seven pathways, and each of them are influenced by genes, and the genes are influenced again by what we do in our our lifestyles. From what you've described, to me, it sounds like with all of the studies and and what we know about genetics, it it really sounds like we're moving away from the one-size-fits-all approach to wellness and, and really getting specific tailoring things to a person's composition. Completely agree. <clears throat> and again, you've just described it perfectly. Um, the Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins, um, he's called it precision medicine and, or personalized medicine. And what it means is that everything we tend to do in healthcare and medicine is one size fits all. So one diet should fit everyone. One prescription should fit everyone. One particular drug is good for every conceivable kind of disease. And again, that's just that's not accurate. So what the epigenetics allows us to do is there are tests, there are assays for genes and blood, and soon they'll be for the biome or the intestinal tract that tell us who we are. So if someone, you know, we're, we're barraged by conflicting information on diet, ketogenic diets, grapefruit juice diets, high fat, low fat, Mediterranean, 
you name it, everyone has a dietary miracle. Well, the problem is that unless we know who we are, how do we know what a good fit is? And there are now genetic tests that can get down to very specific information. They can literally tell you, eat uh, almonds, not walnuts or vice versa, eat walnuts, not almonds, mm -hmm. because genetically you're predisposed to be able to digest one better than the other. So this world of epigenetics opens up personalized medicine, and it's taking pharmacology, it's taking foods, uh, exercise, stress management, environmental exposures, down to the level of what do you as an individual really need rather than a general guideline. It's like if you uh, buy a, a dress or a suit. I mean, one is buying it, the second is the tailoring. So we're talking about tailoring these guidelines to individual use. Doctor, the average person visits his or her physician for a checkup or for routine testing or, or even medical care, and they're given pretty standard treatments on average. For someone who's listening to this conversation and says, you know, I really want to take advantage of what's happening in science and I want to get more tailored care, but the doctor isn't doing that. How can the person find out this information and what type of physician should he or she be visiting? That's a great question. There is a program uh, at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. It was started by a very good friend, longtime colleague, Andrew Weil, uh, well-known author, and it's called the Center for Integrative Medicine, and they've trained physicians who are all over the United States, and all of them have been trained in exactly what we're talking about. They spend two years. They all have conventional medical training, and they've all usually been out in practice for a number of years, and they go back to school for a two-year postdoctoral program in which they learn herbal medicine, uh, Ayurveda, osteo osteopathy, and chiropractic mind-body medicine techniques. So they learn these other techniques and how to integrate them into conventional medicine. So again, if you go to the University of Arizona School of Medicine, Center for Integrative Medicine, there's a roster of physicians all over the United States that are practicing in the way we're talking about. The other is there's the uh, functional medicine group. I believe it's called the Society for Functional Medicine. Again, physicians who practice using predominantly nutrition, stress management techniques, and other interventions for, for uh, more integrated care. Um, the last thing I think is that you're right that when you go and you get a blood test in an annual physical or any kind of physical, you probably get 12 to 15 blood markers back most of which, honestly, is quite meaningless unless it's extremely high or extremely low, and then you pay attention to it. What you really need to get are some of the more what they call advanced biometrics. So there are blood tests from some companies that now look will look at 100 or more subfractions that really tell you the state of your health. And you can access those without going to a doctor, without a prescription. You can get them online and you can have, they're self-administered and they're usually self-explanatory. They usually will be coupled with a coaching session. So when you get your information back, you can sign up to then work with a coach to more completely understand what your blood biomarkers mean and what the genetics are that have led to those blood biomarkers and how you can influence them. So this is all something that we're not talking about a theoretical care five years down the road. We're talking about you have to do a little shopping and you have to be careful. I think the most important thing to remember if you do get genetic testing, uh, that it's simply a piece of information. It's not deterministic. If it says you have a 40% likelihood of disease X, what that means is you have the same markers as 40% of the people who develop that disease. What it doesn't tell you is that there are 60% of the people with the same markers who don't. And how do you avoid developing that disease if you have that marker? So if you get a genetic test, just remember, it's just one point of information. It's not a sentence. It's not pointing the bone. Doctor, in your book, you quote functional medicine pioneer, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who stated that disease is a delusion. And, and I think that's such an interesting statement. What does that mean, that disease is a delusion? Well, uh, Dr. Bland is, I think, brilliant. Um, he's a biochemist and really develop this whole idea of functional medicine. And it simply means that disease is the end product, at least in his original research, of misplaced biochemistry. So eating high fat or high sugar or high red meat diets 
for a while does not show up as disease. But if you continually consume that kind of diet, if you will, the result is a disease. But the disease is an illusion in the sense of it's not inevitable. And if you made changes along the way biochemically in your body, you would not have to manifest that disease. And uh, so that's one dimension of the delusion of disease. The other part that he means, and I think he's very, very good about this, is that once a person is given a diagnosis, they tend to become the disease. They're not a person anymore. They're heart failure or they are uh, osteocarcinoma. You know, they're, they're a disease entity rather than a person who has a disease. Uh, and uh, Plato uh, actually uh, said it was more important to know what person has a disease than what disease a person has. And, I, and that's becoming very true. And so in that sense, the diagnosis or the label of a condition is an illusion. It's a guess. It's, it's something that you use to get compensation and to, re- to create a diagnosis for insurance purposes. It does not reduce the person to that disease. That's a dangerous illusion or delusion. And so I I very much am in agreement with, uh, with Dr. Bland's observations. The book is Change Your Genes, Change Your Life. If you would like to get more information about Dr. Pelletier and his work, you can visit drpelletier.com. That's D-R, drpelletier.com. Doctor, in our final moments, for someone who's my age, middle age, and they've been living a certain lifestyle and they're now 40, 50, 60 years old, is it ever too late to make the changes that can impact our future, our health and wellness at the genetic level? I'm so glad you asked that. No, it is never too late. And I mean that quite literally. Um, Someone who's in their 70s, 80s, or even 90s can make really major, significant changes in their life that affect these biochemical pathways we just talked about that can have the ex- the effect of extending their life expectancy, preserving their mental faculties. We can change genes at any stage of our life, any age at any time. Dr. Pelletier, thank you so much for being here with us. This information, it's so exciting because it gives us so much power over the way we live our life, the way we age. And uh, as you said, it's never too late. So I think it's time that we all get going with it. So thank you for being here. (laughs) Thank you very much. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.